Welcome to the Jewish Community Relations Council's Goodwin Holocaust Museum and Education Center, often known as the GHMEC. The Jewish Community Relations Council works to foster a safe and welcoming environment for community members of all faiths and ethnicities. My name is Helen Kirschbaum, and I'm the Educational Director for the Goodwin Holocaust Museum and Education Center. The Goodwin Museum is the only Holocaust Museum in New Jersey and the only Holocaust Museum between New York and Washington, D.C. With me today are Carol Orwitz, Bernice Glazier, and Sue Marika. They are experienced educators who are part of a wonderful staff of museum docents, and we are here today to help you explore our museum and some of the fascinating artifacts it contains. We hope that your visit to our museum helps you to better understand the events and consequences of the Holocaust. The mission of the GHMEC is to teach people about the past and educate them for the future through the painful lessons of the Holocaust. Our objective is to reduce prejudice and lessen hatred, bigotry, bullying, and violence against all groups. As you explore the museum, we hope that you will adopt these ideas as your own and support the goals of the GHMEC. We cannot emphasize too much that the Holocaust has become an international standard by which to measure crimes against humanity. We must realize that once a person, a country, or a government goes down the slippery slope of racism and lets hatred dominate then genocide, the mass murder of a people based on nationality, race, or religion may follow. The Holocaust mobilized the full efforts and resources of one of the most technologically and culturally advanced nations in the world. It clearly demonstrates why we must learn the historical and moral lessons of this period. We use this front window for changing exhibits. The interior of our museum contains our permanent collection. We invite you inside to learn more about the Holocaust and its relevance to today's world. The upper map shows the area outlined in red of Nazi domination in Europe from 1938 to 1942. The lower black and white map depicts the total number of Jews murdered in each European country. Six million Jews were killed and five million others gypsies, homosexuals, political dissidents, Jehovah's Witnesses, and physically and mentally handicapped. This machine it was a Hollerith machine made by a German subsidiary of IBM for Nazi Germany. The machine was a data processing device used to record national census data. The SS used the machines to monitor large numbers of prisoners shipped in and out of concentration camps during the war. The Nazis were experts in confiscating items from the prisoners for redistribution to people in Germany. Note the photo of the confiscated shoes. The poster that you see is a photograph of survivors taken at Ebensee concentration camp in Austria after the camp was liberated. The poster to the right shows the various cloth markings or yellow stars Jews were forced to wear before they were in the camps. Also, there are badges that Jews and non-Jewish prisoners were forced to wear after they were imprisoned at camps, badges of various shapes and colors which denoted where they came from and why they were at the camp. The colors represented the type of prisoner. For example, yellow was for Jewish, pink was for homosexual. The letters stood for the nationality of the prisoner. The suitcases in the photo were confiscated from prisoners after the selection at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The names on the suitcases bring one to the realization that these suitcases belong to people who were massacred. The items in this case span the years from 1923, rise of the Nazi party, following the World War I, to 1939, just before the outbreak of World War II. In this case, you see Hitler's Mein Kampf, which was written while Hitler was in prison in 1924. Mein Kampf means my struggle. 
In this book, Hitler expounded upon his worldview, including his desire to create an Aryan master race of tall, blonde, blue-eyed, strong people and do away with all people who did not fit this, that description, especially the Jews. No one believed Hitler would carry out his threats, but he carried them out to each detail. Note the picture of Joseph Goebbels on the cover of Time magazine. Goebbels, the prop minister of propaganda, helped Hitler carry out his ideas. Propaganda is defined as the organized dissemination of biased information and allegations to assist or damage the cause of a government or movement. The aim is to influence the audience, whether it is an individual or an entire community. An extreme case of propaganda is shown on the poster on the left side panel. Note the evil depiction of Jews in the cartoons. All of the illustrations were typical anti-Semitic stereotypes of Jewish people used by the Nazi government to teach German children to hate and fear Jews. The story of the poisonous mushroom was in a children's book published by the notorious anti-Semitic publisher, Julius Stryker. One way that the Nazis segregated and dehumanized the Jews was by labeling identity cards. You will see in this first case some passports and ID cards. Jews were required to carry an identity card called a work card. Note Elizabeth Dreyfus's ID card, which has a big red J for Jew stamped on the left side. To further distinguish Jews from non-Jews, they were required to add a middle name to their existing names. Females added Sarah and males added Israel. Note these names on the passports. Persecution developed in Germany from 1933 to 1939. In 1935, the Jews had their citizen and all civil rights stripped away by the passage of the Nuremberg Laws. They were considered subjects of the state instead of citizens of the state. This meant that the state, the police, the judiciary, and any other governmental authorities, as well as civilians, could do anything they wanted to the Jews and that the Jews had no recourse. The Jews became a large, separate, isolated group in Germany. On November 9th and 10th, there was a terrible riot called a pogrom in which synagogues, Jewish stores, and homes were looted, desecrated, and destroyed. 20,000 Jewish men were sent temporarily to concentration camps. Synagogues all over Germany and Austria were set on fire. All books from Jewish homes and synagogues were also burned. Here you see a picture of the synagogue burning. This event came to be known as Kristallnacht, or Night of the Broken Glass, from the shards of smashed windows of the synagogues, homes, and stores. This case displays the German army and Nazi memorabilia. You see a picture here of the Hitler Youth, girls and boys saluting Hitler. These children were brainwashed with the racist ideology that they deserved to rule over others. By the way, this is the same stadium where in 1936, during the Olympics, Jesse Owens, an African American, won four gold medals in track and field. Notice how thousands of people are cheering for Hitler. This is symbolic of his popularity. The symbol of the Nazi regime was the swastika. Until the Nazis turned into a hate symbol and one of white supremacy, the swastika was a positive symbol. It was an ancient symbol used for 3,000 years in many cultures around the world, including India and Native Americans. Hitler had several instruments of terror that they used to enforce their power. The highest one was the Gestapo, or the secret police, organized by Goering. Then we had the black shirts, the SS. This was the, started out as a primary bodyguard of Hitler under the command of Heinrich Himmler, and it became the elite fighting force. You will note in the case 
many symbols on some of this, uh, these artifacts. The next group are the brown shirts, or the SA, the stormtroopers. And their goal was to intimidate people and use force if necessary. In the case, you see an article about the Vansi Conference, which took place on January 20th, 1942, outside of Berlin. There were 15 ranking Nazi members, including Reinhard Heydrich, chief of the Reich Security Main Office, to discuss the final solution of the Jewish question. This was a code name for the systematic, deliberate, physical annihilation of European Jews. At the conference, Heydrich informed the officials there about the Nazi regime's plan for the Jews and secured support from them to implement what we call the final solution. Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939 and took over the country in a mere three weeks. In this case, you can see that the event began a terrible pe period for the Jewish people. After Germany consolidated its victory in Poland, Germans began to round up Jews and put them in smaller and smaller sections of cities walled off by bricks and barbed wire called ghettos, which were surrounded by German soldiers. Anyone who tried to escape was shot on the spot. There were increasingly terrible conditions of overcrowding, starvation, and disease, which killed large numbers of Jews. Nazis tried to destroy the Jewish people, not only physically, but also spiritually, by burning Torahs, those scrolls containing the, f the first five books of the Holy Bible, and other sacred objects. To humiliate the Jews, the Nazis had musical instruments and other objects made from sacred scrolls, as in the shoe insoles and the banjo. The Nazis desecrated a Torah to make the backing of the banjo in the case. The Hebrew writing in the scroll is visible behind the strings. Some Jews tried to resist and fight back as best they could. They hid in the forest and served as partisans, fighters who would attack Nazi units. Jews also fought back in the ghettos, the most famous of which was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which lasted for nearly a month from April 19th to May 16, 1943. There were all kinds of resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, See the photo of the milk can, the can buried by the Jews there in the hopes that people would find it later after they were gone, contained diaries, documents, papers, and posters of the doomed community. Even in the worst of the death camps, there were various kinds of moral, spiritual, and even physical resistance. In France, a large part of French resistance was carried out by Jews as part of the underground French forces of the interior. Note the armband in the case worn by a partisan fighter. Many women also took part in the resistance. Note the photo of women and men together in the case. This exhibit is entitled Sonia's Legacy. The lithographs it contains were donated by Dr. Robert Fischel, Sonia's cousin. When Dr. Fischel visited the Jewish Museum of Prague in the Czech Republic recently, he was shocked to see his cousin's paintings displayed. Sonia and her family were taken from their home in Prague to Terezin, a concentration camp. This was a so-called model camp used especially for when the International Red Cross visited to inspect conditions. The Nazis cleaned up the camp, sending sick and starving inmates away to extermination camps or killing them there so that only the relatively healthy appearing prisoners remained and made the camp look like a summer camp full of happy prisoners engaging in cultural and social activities. This was a deception created by the Nazis that the International Red Cross visitors believed and reported to the world after their visit. Friedel Dicker Brandeis, a noted artist who was deported to Terrison, taught art to hundreds of children who were incarcerated there, including Sonia. The brilliant Dicker Brandeis helped the children to use their memories and imaginations to overcome the horrors around them, a form of art therapy before it even had a name. After the war, 4,500 of the children's paintings and drawings were discovered. 
The teacher had hidden them in two suitcases, which she left behind in terrorism. Sonia and her family, as well as Friedel Dicker Brandeis, were murdered in Auschwitz. Sonia and her sister were among the 1.5 million children murdered by the Nazis during the Holocaust. When people arrived at concentration camps, they were given a uniform. Note the striped jacket and a hat, part of the concentration camp uniform, giving the inmates numbers instead of names and forcing them to wear these uniforms were means of dehumanizing the prisoners. The garments were rarely cleaned or deloused. They were worn year round. Consequently, the filth caused the spread of lice, which led to the disease typhus, which causes a high fever. Many inmates died from typhus and other diseases, such as pneumonia and tuberculosis, such as Anne Frank and her sister. You will see a picture of the uncomfortable wooden bunks with no blankets or pillows, which were in the barracks in the camps. The arrow points to Elie Wiesel, who was imprisoned in Auschwitz and Buchenwald. Today, he has become a famous author and spokesperson for peace and tolerance. Three levels high, prisoners were packed in six or more to a bunk. Men and women were in separate barracks, using their bowls as pillows. If these bowls were stolen, inmates would not receive their daily allotment of soup. This so-called soup consisted of warm water and potato peels or turnip heads. This case has objects from concentration camps. Note the Zyklon B can. Zyklon B, a cyanide pellet, was administered to the top of the gas chamber. The asphyxiation process took 15 to 20 minutes. This form of murder was considered more efficient because prior to that, the Germans shot their victims and buried their bodies in big pits. Pay special attention to the drawings, glimpses of a world we hope never to see again. All the drawings were saved by local Auschwitz survivors. There is a letter in the case sent by Max Bhutan, a local survivor. He wrote the letter on the way to a concentration camp um, outside of Paris. When he was there, a kind stranger offered him paper. He wrote the letter in the case to his parents, notifying him that he and his brother were alive, and the stranger mailed it for him. You can see his mother's kisses on the letter that tells her that her two sons are still alive. You see the artistic glass depiction of Jews who went to their deaths in Auschwitz. The broken glass symbolizes broken lives and Kristallnacht. Note the buttons in the case. They were worn by Jews called Sonderkommandos, or special work details. These men were forced to remove bodies from the gas chambers and place them in huge furnaces called crematoria. They were regularly killed so they could not be eyewitnesses, yet some of them wrote about what they witnessed and buried the notes near the crematoria where they were discovered after the war. Priests, intellectuals, labor and political leaders of the conquered peoples were also murdered at the camps. The Germans wanted to assure that there would be no one left to lead a revolt against them. Here you also see whips and other instruments of torture that the brutal and sadistic guards used against inmates. Yad Vashem in Israel was established to perpetuate the memory of the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust. It is the, one of the many museums and memorials in Israel. In 1963, the Remembrance Authority embarked upon a worldwide project to grant the title of Righteous Among the Nations to a few who helped the Jews in the darkest time of their history. Today there is an Avenue of the Righteous, which houses over 10,000 non-Jews who saved Jewish people's lives. Some of them did it by hiding Jews, some did it by providing false papers, some smuggled and assisted Jews to escape, and some rescued children. One of the most famous of the rescuers was Ra Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat who issued false Swedish passports to approximately 100,000 Hungarian Jews and put them in safe houses. Unfortunately, he was imprisoned as a spy and nobody knows what his fate was. Jan Karski, a Polish resistance hero, joined the underground army and began a became a legendary courier, sneaking into the Warsaw Ghetto twice. He disguised himself as a Nazi guard. He saw what was happening with the killing and torture of the Jews and met personally with President Franklin Roosevelt. 
Unfortunately, Karski was unable to convince any of the political leaders to take military action against death camp targets. Josiah Du Bois was born in Camden and raised in Woodbury, New Jersey. His department worked with the U.S. State Department, which was involved in funding for refugee relief. He documented all that he saw and brought the suppression of evidence to the t attention of the Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, Jr. Then he wrote a memorandum entitled On the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of Jews. He threatened to present the memo to the press and the public unless President Franklin Roosevelt created a commission to help rescue Jews. As a result of this action, President Roosevelt created the War Refugee Board and Du Bois was appointed its general counsel. The War Refugee Board rescued more than 200,000 Jewish refugees during the last 15 months of the war and created a safe haven for about 1,000 Jewish refugees at Fort Ontario in Oswego, New York. There were many politicians and diplomats and even ordinary people who are considered to be the righteous of the nations. Irina Sendler, a Polish Catholic social worker, quietly saved the lives of 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto. She went into the Warsaw Ghetto every day for over 16 months, posing as a nurse. She smuggled out children, placed them in orphanages, convents, and often with Polish families. She hid the only records of their true identities and in their locations, in jars buried in a friend's garden across the street from Nazi headquarters. She kept this a secret and never betrayed her associates, not even when she was caught and tortured by the Gestapo. There are many politicians such as Chian Sugihara, Dr. Fen Shen Ho, who were diplomats, one from Lithuania and one from Vienna, who were able to give people visas so that they were able to flee their country. On the bottom shelf are papers donated by Lisa Van Dyke, a survivor in our community, whose family received one of the transit visas to Shanghai from Dr. Feng Shan Ho. There were even countries that helped to save their Jews. Notice the boat, the Danish rescue boat. Denmark was the only Nazi-occupied country that actively resisted the Nazis' regime and to deport its Jewish citizens. Within a two-week period, during the fall of 1943, Danish fishermen undertook a nationwide effort to smuggle Jews by sea to neutral Sweden. This action saved 7,200 Danish Jews and over 99% of Denmark's Jewish population. The first community to have all its inhabitants recognized as righteous among the nations was La Chambon in France. From December 1940 to September 1944, Pastor Andre Trachme and his wife Magda as well as inhabitants of this village of 5,000, provided refuge for 5,000 Jews. Again, Trachme was arrested. After his release, he still continued to shelter Jews until the end of the war. Note the photo of the late Anton Chichinsky with Shelley Zeger. Shelley, who now lives in New Jersey, was born in Poland. When Shelley and his family faced deportation from the ghetto, they turned to Anton. This man, known as the town fool, used spoons to dig a hole under his cellar to hide Shelley, his parents, his brothers, and two other young girls for 27 months. Remember that those who saved one life are just as important as those who saved thousands of lives. Liberators were American, British, and Soviet soldiers who entered the camps within the first 48 hours of their discovery. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, commander of the Allied forces in Europe, ordered all nearby troops 
to visit the camps to witness the horrible scenes and atrocities committed here. He ordered army photographers and movie filmmakers to record what they saw so no one later could deny the horror that took place in the concentration and death camps. You will note in the case a uniform of an American soldier, a photo of the member of the Jewish Brigade Group of, British, of the British Army. After the war was over in 1945, many of the Jewish survivors could not go back to their home and towns. In the earlier war years, when the Jews were forced from their homes and deported, their former non-Jewish neighbors moved into their homes and took over their possessions. At the end of the war, the Jews tried to reclaim their property or to look for family members who may have survived. The Allied forces set up DP, or displaced persons camps, for survivors in Germany. Sometimes survivors lived in DP camps for several years until they got visas to come to the United States or go to other countries. The display in this case shows two U.S. veterans. After 1945, most countries remained closed to refugees. From November 10th, 1945 to October 1st, 1946, the initial trial of the major war crimes, 22 top Nazis in Hitler's regime began in Nuremberg, Germany. Nazi leaders were tried for war crimes and crimes against humanity, a new charge drafted in the London Charter of the International Military Tribunal. In the Charter, crimes against humanity was defined as murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds. Crimes against humanity included forced labor, medical experiments in concentration camps, and mass murder of innocent civilians during the war. Also in this case is a display about the genocide in Darfur in the western region of the Sudan in Africa. In February 2003, groups of black Africans rose up to fight what they, what they saw as discrimination by the largely Arab government. The Sudanese president responded by arming Arabs from local tribes and began attacking farmers and forcing them from their homes. Between 2003 and 2005, at least 200,000 civilians were killed. Today, over two million people, one-third of the population of Darfur, are displaced, living in camps, starving and sick. Note the photo of Dr. Jerry Ehrlich, a pediatrician in Cherry Hill, who volunteered for Doctors Without Borders in Darfur in 2004, treating sick children. In the displaced persons camps, he took photographs of the people and he brought crowns and paper with him for the children to draw pictures of their lives. He brought back 150 vivid drawings. We would like to take some time to look at the wall hanging that we created with photos of Holocaust survivors from our community. The individual stories of survival are awe-inspiring. They serve as a reminder to all of us that the human spirit will always endure and that it is the responsibility of each individual to speak out against prejudice, bigotry, and violence against all groups. Every survivor had his or own, her own unique experience. No two stories are alike. The only similarity is that each survivor's life was changed forever because of the hatred and the prejudice that were allowed to exist during this horrific period in history. As we collected these photos, it became a reminder that so many people had no photos remaining of family from before the war. But as we gathered this wonderful collection, each picture told a little more of what happened as they lived through one of the worst ever examples of man's inhumanity to man. Here you see Ernest Kaufman, who escaped Nazi Germany and found safety in the United States. 
When the Americans entered the war, Ernest joined the United States Army and helped to liberate his hometown in Germany, although it was too late to save his own family. Jerry Baruch was saved by nuns who hid her in a convent. Charlotte Weiss survived together with her four sisters through the entire horrible experience. Eva Weiner was an infant as she and her family were on the St. Louis. As it was turned away from Cuba and almost every other country in the world, including the United States. This picture always seems to draw me in the most as I look at these two young, innocent faces on their wedding day and know that Jacob Finkelstein had been in a concentration camp and then hid on his own in the woods. Rivka Finkelstein lived under a stack of hay outdoors for over two years, and yet you see there their hope for the future. Every one of these pictures has its own unique story, but the lesson from all of them is that the resilience of all of these amazing people and their ability to rebuild their lives is a true testimony to the strength of the human spirit. Our museum is small, but it is filled with history and important lessons for living in today's world. As you have seen, we try to use every inch of space that is available to us, which is why one of our maps is located in the floor and some of the important messages that we hope you will remember as you study more about the Holocaust are located in our ceiling. Every individual can make a difference in their school, their community, and their world. So please start today and become an upstander in the effort to make never again a reality.